What a beautiful day it is to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti. Welcome and greetings this beautiful spring morning to worship online with the First Presbyterian Church of Ypsilanti. So I offer you this greeting that, beloved, we are God's children now. When Christ is revealed, we will be like him. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection may through the renewing power of your spirit arise from the death of sin to life of righteousness through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue to hear with wonder the songs and the stories of resurrection on this third Sunday of Easter. Turning our attention now to a resurrection story that comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter. This follows upon the story of the women finding the tomb empty in amazement and the road to Emmaus where Jesus broke bread, told the word broke bread and blessed them, and they saw him in their midst. And last week we went to that John's Gospel of Thomas the Doubter. And this week we find Jesus again with the disciples in the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning at the 36th verse. For Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? Why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I, myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. 
You were witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Many wondrous stories in Luke and John and Matthew. Mark, of course, is sparse on the resurrection. Peace be with you. Why are you frightened? Touch me and see. I am not a ghost. In the midst of their joy, they disbelieve. And he turns to them with those most humble words. Have you anything to eat? For he too is hungry, and they fed him, and he fed them with the word to reassure them that all that had been written has now been fulfilled, and their minds can be open to a new vision and new ways. And this new way is one of repentance, which of course many of the prophets have always preached, but this way of forgiveness to be proclaimed to all and that we, who too believe, are witnesses of all these things. To be a witness, to see and to speak. Somehow to overcome our reticence to be silent or amidst our doubts, as we heard last week, but to walk forward with Christ. Luke offers by far the most extended account of Jesus' interactions with his disciples on that first Easter. In Luke's story, Jesus appears to the women at the empty tomb. He encounters two more disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then meets, as I just read, the rest of the disciples back in Jerusalem. Luke, it appears, is at pains to explain how Jesus' death and resurrection fulfill the promises of the Old Testament and its implications for the life of his community and then by extension, of course, all of us. All of us who are witnesses until the ages, that great cloud of witnesses in every time and place, cheering us on from the balcony as the preacher of the Hebrews reminds us. In this light, the first two panels of this resurrection triptych Triptych is a medieval term where they would paint panels of the story of the resurrection to put up in front of the church great illuminated pictures of the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Well, in this triptych today, the first one parallels to a large degree that of Mark and Matthew. They went and saw the tomb was empty and they went and shared the good news in joy and in fear. The second, the road to Emmaus, a village about nine miles from Jerusalem, lays out a pattern of how Jesus interacts with his disciples by mirroring the worship of Luke's community and many Christian communities ever since. They encounter with the living Lord the proclamation understanding of the word, a meal where bread is broken and wine is shared, and then the sending forth as they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the others. But the third one today is different. Now, I'm only guessing here, but looking at the words Luke has said about Jesus wonders, do you think I'm only a ghost? That perhaps writing 50 or 60 years after the events he is narrating, Luke is contending with questions, questions in the community or out there on the street, about whether Jesus was really raised from the dead, or whether the initial disciples just had visions about him. Questions, of course, that persist to this day. Hence, Jesus' urgency to prove to the disciples he is not a ghost. First, by inviting the disciples to touch him, because we all know can't touch a ghost. Anybody who's seen Casper knows that. And then by asking for and eating fish, because we all really, really know a ghost can't eat. And certainly in my house, if my children turned into ghosts, the first thing they would ask for would not be fish to eat. But here we go. 
Well, that's what I normally thought about all this. Somehow it's a legal argument, evidence and testimony. But this year as I pondered this talk this week, after a year of isolation, of interacting with people primarily in some weeks exclusively by phone and Zoom, after preaching to a camera or a phone for 55 Sundays in a row, sharing with people I almost never get to see. I think about Luke's emphasis on the physical element of Jesus' resurrection differently. There is something hard to grasp, but integral about being present with one another in the body. And Luke wants to stress that this promise of resurrection existence is all part of it. So it's really, really important for Luke, I think, to tell the story in a way that emphasizes that Jesus isn't, well, a ghost. The disciples didn't merely have ecstatic visions, but actually saw, touched, and interacted physically with their Lord. All this reminds me of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth in the 15th chapter, which is the promise often read at funerals, where he insists on the resurrection. He writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. Paul can almost sound defensive in these lines if he's trying to threaten or bully the Corinthians into affirming Christ's resurrection. But the urgency for Paul becomes clear just a bit later on. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. What's at stake for Paul, and I believe for Luke, is not about affirming a doctrinal, let alone a metaphysical assertion but instead linking God's redemptive work to our actual experience. Paul here is what he always has been, one who gives witness as a pastor to the grace of God and God's living presence. To us who are physical, material, flesh and bones kind of people, One temptation of the people of faith, I think, is not so much as to disbelieve, which was last week's sermon. For as I said last week, doubting what happens when God gets involved in our lives seems like the most natural and biblical response possible. But the primary temptation for this Sunday, we were reminded is to reduce and describe and contain God's actions in ways we can easily understand. There's some advantages in that. Perhaps if we can't understand God, then God would remain beyond us, which in turn means we can't tame or domesticate or control God. And well, you know, we do tend to fear those things we can't control death being chief among them. Perhaps the chief way we attempt to describe and understand and ultimately limit and control God is the all-too-natural belief that, A, God is certainly way, way beyond us. And therefore, B, the chief task of the religious life is to improve ourselves and to reach towards God, which maybe we can control. You know, each and every day I become better and better in every way. The end result is to be less human and more like God. 
eventually escaping the confines of this mortal life to live as a spirit with the eternal spirit and all that jazz. In contrast, the Bible over and over again tells us we cannot domesticate God. Across the scriptures, and particularly in the New Testament, the story told is not one of our journey, humanity's journey, as one of improvement and spiritual enlightenment, but rather it's actually the eternal and holy God that embarks on a journey a journey to be like us and to encounter us where we are. From the pains of Mary's childbirth and Jesus' messy birth, as if there's any other kind, to his grief over losing a friend, to both his joy in and disappointment with his disciples, to his isolation in Gethsemane and despair on the cross. The picture of Christ's life and ministry and death is one of God embracing all of that we are, all who we are, just as we are. God understands us as we are, embraces and accepts us as we are, loves us as we are, and redeems us just as we are. So also in the story of the resurrection, God comes to real people, redeems real people, promises to resurrect real and also physical people. Perhaps it's understandable to want to question physical resurrection. And of course, the disciples and anyone else who takes it seriously do question it. But by reducing it to a spiritual or psychological experience that we can understand, we have so limited the power of God. But the flip side of all this is to recognize a God that we can understand and describe probably really can't save us. In Auden's little poem, For the Time Being, the shepherds make their way to Bethlehem, and as they go there, they declare, nothing can save us that is possible, we who are about to die demand a miracle. Jesus is really resurrected because God really intends to redeem, save, and bless us as we are. Physical, mortal, limited, vulnerable, really. Which may give comfort to us any time, but especially now. As among other things it has done, this pandemic has reminded us just how physical, mortal, limited, and vulnerable we really are. And amidst of all these limitations, we hear the promise in this goofy, even a little bit weird, story that God and Jesus still comes for us. And so Luke is, in fact, at pains to remind us that what's at stake in resurrection is not a doctrinal affirmation, but rather a true promise that God gets us, loves us, comes for us, and redeems us just as we are right now. Really. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
joy this morning to present third grade Bibles to our third graders, Isla Geiselman and Elliot Kroll. Of course, they're home today, but I wish them well and blessings in their families. So we have a new adventure Bible there in third grade and reading well, I know both of them. And let me just share every time we dedicate our Bibles, the delight of Alice Calder designed a bookmark many years ago. And I'll just read it and share it with us all. Where she says, under our left thumb you will see, you take your Bible in your hand and under your left thumb you will see the laws of Genesis to Deuteronomy. After that section is a large one about kings who was in charge. Open it up to the middle. And you will find each and half of Psalm in your palm. That's where you'll find the book of Psalms. Now take the back half and divide it in two. And you're at the gospel, Jesus' word for you. Go back a section towards your left thumb. All those prophets tell us what is to come. Under your right thumb is a section that is small, but there you'll find the letters of Paul. It's a delight to give them this adventure Bible, which includes many helps and talks about what was life like in the first century at times of Jesus. What do some of these fancy words mean to you? And I hope it's easy and delightful to take time to read just a little bit. If I was to tell you where to start, I would say read the first 10 Psalms to get an idea of the flow. But then pick a simple gospel, like Mark's or Luke's, and just read it straight through. It's not very long. Take an hour or two, and you'll get the orientation of what it's all about for life ahead. For may you journey true with Christ your whole life long. So I offer together our prayer, as was sent out in the bulletin, if you join me at home. God of love and care, Thank you for your word that lives in the Bible and has actively lived in human lives in ages past and today. Through reading, studying, and acting out this living word of God, we are your family of faith, transforming our lives and the world on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So gracious God, we come to you in prayer this day that all who were weary and carrying heavy burdens would come to this table in prayer wherever they are, just as they are. For Christ has come to meet you in the room you are locked in and in the places you go fishing and rejoice in, in the places you bow your head and grieve in. When you sit around a table with family or friends, and break bread together. He is there in the midst of us with his living presence. So gracious God, hear our prayers. We pray for your church, the proclamation of truth with humility, truth with flexibility, truth that meets people where they're at in the wounded places and the joys of their life to delight in them as he delights in us, to cry with them as they mourn and cry, to instill with courage as he gives us courage for the living of these days. For gracious God, we lament that we are not face to face with each other, but we wait for the time when we can come together through the work of science, through the work of efforts of policy, for the work of individuals, inoculating and serving and caring that we can return safely to being in each other's presence and not put one another at risk of illness and even death. Gracious Lord, guide us and keep us as your church until we come together again. Dearest Lord, we pray for families, especially for children who are home all too much, isolated from friends and activities, Inspire their parents and those others who are teachers and caregivers of youth to reach out to them and connect. 
For it is through connection that you have made us and created us, just as you were one in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we be one as the body of Christ. Through all faiths and all traditions, we realize that when we look upon each other face to face, we are truly human and truly loved. Gracious Lord, we pray for our members in our congregation, for Harold Lanning, for Mary Hall, for Mary Shell and Mary Ann Ray Green, for others who have heavy hearts, for those who are looking for work, for those who yearn to serve, for those who are waiting for joy to return. We give thanks that Jennifer Renault is home from the hospital. Care for her and Wayne. Gracious Lord, we left up to you those who volunteer and work at our Wednesday night meal, for they too feel heavy burdens and isolation. Help connect them to the power of your spirit. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have helped us over the years at Westminster Presbyterian and First Ann Arbor, for Northside Presbyterian and Celine and Milan, that we too can serve once more together hand in hand as safety returns in the coming months. For we know when we come together, the burden is lighter. The work of many hands can lift many things. Gracious Lord, we pray with thanksgiving for the beauty of the flowers, for the sounds of music, for your creation, yearning to be made new. Hear our prayer. May the word that has inspired many saints along the way, from as we heard yesterday, from St. George's Chapel, a word that inspires princes and queens, a word that inspires the gardener and the cook, the word that inspires the children, the word that keeps us and holds us and brings us home. We give thanksgiving. For gracious Lord, hear our prayers. May we as the people of God pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
Go forth today with the good word upon your heart and in your mind, for we go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a place and a purpose for us in being there. For Christ who dwells in us has something he wants to do through us, where we are right now. Believe this and go in the grace and love and communion of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.